You are listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, where we believe the Bible is sufficient and answers life's problems. I'm your host, Pastor Jeff Christensen. This podcast is for everyone in the body of Christ, staff pastor, church leader, caring homemaker, the responsible businessman, everybody. But it's also for my Calvary Chapel University students. Shout out. Hello to you guys. All of us are called to offer counsel regularly. And we every day need a word of counsel from the Lord. So these episodes are designed to assist you in learning to give godly counsel. Also to develop discernment in evaluating counsel that you receive. So it's my prayer that these podcasts, that these episodes will enlarge your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a wonderful counselor. God bless you. Grab your Bibles. Let's get started. See you on the inside. Welcome back to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. My name is Jeff Christensen, and I'm your host. We're going to be looking at today an important topic on the ability, the character of God's Word, that it is living, powerful, sharp, and that it can it has an ability to change and transform lives. So let's go ahead. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And we're just going to dive into this and dissect this passage of Scripture. And it might take us two podcast episodes. So this is part one of a two-part episode. We'll look at the first section of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which reads, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's part one. And then part two, we'll look at in the next episode that it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and joints of marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so we're going to we're going to dissect and divide, rightly divide the word of God here, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and we're going to look at the character of the word and the ability of the word, and it's my prayer that your vision, that the listener, uh, my student, my friends, my loved ones, those uh, that are listening to this podcast, that your vision for God's word would increase, that you would just have a a fuller appreciation and vision for the word of God, but your faith also in the word would be built up. You would be edified that you would have a greater trust in the word of God. And then uh, finally, number three, my prayer as we do these next two episodes together is that you will develop a deeper uh uh, hunger, appetite for the Word of God, that it would be stirred up in you. So let's begin, and I'd like to begin in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So if you have a Bible, digital device, uh, if you're multitasking, come back to me, and let's dive in together, and let's spend some reverential attentiveness to this passage of Scripture. Pay attention like you've never paid attention before if you are uh, wanting to really get the most out of this. And I think you are, because do you know that every time we come before the Scripture, before the Word of God, it's as if we're sitting before the Lord God Almighty, the Creator, Redeemer Himself, and allowing Him to express His very heart and mind to us. That speaks of speaks into the inspiration of the Word of God, that the Word of God is inspired, it is God-breathed, it is God's heart, His mind, His will, His way has been um, breathed into the Word of God. Now remember, there's 66 books, 40 authors. We're going to talk a little bit about bibliology before we look at this scripture, because the it says here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is. God's getting ready to tell us what the word of God is. And so we should pay attention when, when he's saying by his Holy Spirit, the word of God is dot, dot, dot. And then he begins to describe what the word of God is. We ought to open our, our hearts, our minds and zero in and pay attention. So when we're sitting before the scripture, uh, 
We're sitting before God because it's God breathed. That's what the topic of the inspiration of the scripture is. The 40 authors were inspired by God. In other words, God used their um, their personalities, their vocabulary, their culture, uh, their season of life in their relationship with God that he worked upon them, in them, through them to write exactly what he wanted them to write. A lot of times they didn't know exactly what God was showing them in full clarity, especially uh, sometimes uh, predictive prophecy wasn't always clear to the writer what was about to take place in the future, but they wrote down what God showed them to write down, not as artificial intelligence or automatrons or robotic uh, pencil pushers, but they were more in a, a walking, abiding relationship with God Almighty. And he was, because of that relationship, able to use them giftedly to inspire the word of God and have them write exactly what he wanted to be communicated to mankind, to us, to humanity. It's written in a book. So the word of God is inspired. Not only is it inspired, but it's inerrant in the original autograph. But we can also trust uh, the the manuscript evidence, I know there's some discrepancy here and there with the manuscript evidence, depending on which uh, school of thought you're from, looking at the, especially, not so much in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, but mostly in the New Testament, Greek, Aramaic, those uh, manuscripts, there's some discrepancies there, but no doctrinal um, discrepancy really uh, that we would uh call the majors, maybe some minor um, uh, battles of crossing T's and dotting I's and jots and tittles might not be uh, perfectly aligned, but I believe God has transmitted or the transmission of the word of God has come uh, from God to us. And so I really believe that we can trust the word of God. That's what inerrancy is going to be, that is going to kind of describe that it's accurate, that we can trust it, that this English translation that you have, as long as it's conservative, regular, you know, word for word type translation, you're going to trust it. You can trust it. Your English translation or your Spanish translation or your Russian translation or your, um, you know, Chinese or what language you speak, the, the, the scholars that translated it, I believe God supervised Uh, the translations of the word of God. So we can trust it. That's inerrancy. Okay. Uh, There's inspiration. God breathed inerrancy. It's, it's trustworthy, supervised transmission from the author through human language to us today. I believe God has uh, cared for it, especially if you think of the Jewish people in the Hebrew text and some of the scholars that have cared for the word of God, we could trust it. Also, it's authoritative. The word of God is authoritative. So we're, again, we're talking a little bit about the topic of bibliology, that the word of God is authoritative, that it's our final authority, that the word of God is what we filter. We, through the, the grid of scripture, we filter everything uh, that comes to us that we have a biblical worldview. So it's our final arbitrator when we are trying to discern uh, morality and right and wrong and and God's will versus man's will, God's way versus man's way, spirit versus flesh. And when we want to know law versus grace and when we want to know, um, uh, filter the culture through the word of God, we call that authority. The word of God is authority. The Lord himself is our master. And when he gives a command, Um, we abide by the word of God. For example, when you're talking about um, the latest sexual revolution in our country around the world with things like LGBTQ plus and so on and so forth, that the Bible would teach one man, one woman biologically for life are married in that sexual encounter is how God has designed it. And so we want to kind of look at the authority of the word of God. Otherwise, we're open to everything and the redefinition of marriage. So the Bible trumps culture, sociology, uh, 
um, humanistic anthropology, biological psychology, and psychotherapy. The Word of God is our final authority. So we've got we've covered inspiration. We've covered inerrancy. We've covered authority. Also, perspicuity. That's the word we could use. That's uh, clarity, uh, the clarity of the Scripture. And uh, that means the Word of God is clear, that a, a child can understand the Word of God. Hey, Kathy, how are you? God bless you. I'm going to pause right now to say hello to anybody uh, that's listening in on Facebook Live. Blessings to you. Um, but back to the podcast, because I'm recording this uh, for my students as they're going to be listening to this podcast. But I'm also on Facebook Live at this point right now talking about the bibliology, the authority of the Word of God, that it is authoritative. And then it is clear. Perspicuity means the Word of God is clear that a child can understand it, but it has a depth that a scholar uh, can never mine the bottom of it. And so I think the word of God is clear. It's also necessary, the necessity of the word of God, um, that the word of God is necessary for revealing God's will and the plan of salvation and the end times that we would not know about Jesus except for the special revelation of the Word of God. Now, general revelation, we can discern God exists because he's put a witness in our heart, and general revelation kind of uh, is common to man, common grace, common revelation to mankind, but special revelation is in the Word of God, and I think it's necessary. So the necessity, and then finally, I want to talk about sufficiency. Sufficiency is big with us as disciplers, as those that care for souls. We're, uh, we do soul care, which is, we could call it biblical counseling, we could call it biblical discipleship, we could call it biblical soul care, we could say it's uh, helping one another, um, it's called studies and sanctification and practical theology. I think biblical counseling is a theological issue, a practical theological issue. And so we believe in its sufficiency, that it is adequate, that it's super sufficient, that it has the answers, that it is all we need. We do not need uh, the humanistic, philosophical ways to know how to to know how to live a godly life. With that, <laughs> that's kind of uh, to build up our trust in the Word of God. There is the truth of in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We're going to look at the first half of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and then we will, uh, we will dive into the second half in our next episode. So that's our present study, and we're going to look at that. God's Word has a built-in ability and a character, and then we'll look at uh, other passages of Scripture to shed light or illuminate or verify, validate, uh, correlate this passage of Scripture. The best commentary in the Bible is the Bible itself. So our Hebrews text, chapter 4, verse 12 the reason the Word of God is so able to do great things in our life is it has a unique characteristic. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Scripture is saying, let's start there, the Word of God is. Like I said in the beginning, you know, when we hear that phrase, the Holy Spirit is alerting us. God's about to tell us what the Word of God is. The Word of God is. Uh and the nature and essence of his word is about to be unfolded. This is God speaking, not man. So the character of the very being of God is behind the word he speaks. God's word, he says, the word of God is, what is it? Living. So if you're in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, circle living. It's living. It's alive. It's quick. If you're in uh, the King James Version, it's not dead human literature. Nothing wrong with uh, good literature, especially godly literature. Uh, 
but uh, this is a live literature and it's not dead. And, you know, when you go to a college or a university, a lot of times in, in a college or a university environment, uh, you're going to, uh, you're going to, and, you know, when I was in school, when I was in university, when I was in a liberal arts college, a secular college, you could take a course on world religions and they would treat the Bibles just another textbook among other ancient pieces of literature in a religion class and the instructors expound on it and kind of bringing it down to the level of all the rest of the dead human religious literature. We were talking about the authority of the word of God. Everything is subjective to the final authority of the word of God. And we filter uh, through the grid of scripture, everything uh, concerning, uh, you know, when we read, when we study. And I think it's a major mistake and a headache to God to know that the Bible is uh, across the nation, not treated as it is in deed and truth, the very word of God. Word of God is living. That's what the first uh, phrase is. It's alive. John says in, uh, well, Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 63, the words I speak to you are spirit and they, they are life. And that's what they are. They're life. They bring life. They change life. They transform life. They're life-giving life uh, it causes life to flourish when we're in the word of God. The very life of God is described and communicated through them. And God's life is offered to us in the word of God. Everything God has said, whether it's God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit, it's spirit and life. That's what Jesus said. And it describes all of the word of God. Matthew chapter four, verse four. Remember, Jesus was tempted by the enemy to turn stones into bread. Remember, you know, I was uh, in Israel and I saw these high desert kind of rocky ground area that it seemed like, uh, boy, that would be tempting if I was not eating for 40 days or so forth, or I was starving and then I had the per the power to change stones to bread. They look like loaves of bread. And I would like, you know, but Jesus laid aside the prerogative of deity and he did not do it. But what did he say? It is written, man shall not live, not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we're to live by every word God has spoken. It's because God's word is life. It's living. It brings life. It's got a dynamic, a characteristic to it. It's the very life and heartbeat of God. And we need to understand that as we receive the word, it's more than just academic understanding and insight. We're receiving life, spiritual life. And if we want to be alive, spiritually vital, we must have a constant a uh, uh, regular diet taking in the living word of God. And I think uh, many Christians uh, miss out on the importance of being in the word of God every day. And a lot of times people feed on a lot of kinds of literature and they neglect the word of God. And so man's words, you know what I find and let's, let's take a break here and talk about humanistic psychological uh, theory. If a person wants to study to become a counselor within um, a Christian university, typically they have to read books and textbooks that were written by godless men that were atheistic and they hate God and they explain life without God involved, and they do not believe the scripture is the word of God. And they integrate that and put a sticky note on those things of passages of scripture, or they baptize it in a little bit of Christianese, and they call it Christian counseling. It's not. And let me just say, you cannot uh, water down the word of God with humanism and think you're going to come up with something better. And I'm, I'm just here to make that point that it is not 
living. It's merely man's best effort, man's best guesses on how things are. They are not spirit, and we cannot live by those words of Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, Carl Sagan, even if those words numbered in the billions because they are not life. And they might be exciting and they might seem intriguing, but they do not impart life. They cannot. And there's no way that they have any comparison To the word of God. And so we, though, can live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God because they are spirit and truth, because the very life of God is involved in it because God is speaking. So let's continue. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful. Um, Living and powerful. Something could be living, but not necessarily powerful or not necessarily active a snail for example i grew up in southern california and i remember snails and snails were interesting to me snails were all over the place or all over the sidewalks everywhere you go especially in certain times of the year snails galore if you grew up in southern california you know what i'm talking about snails all over the place inland near the beach didn't matter where you lived in California, there were snails in the yard and on the sidewalks and crawling across the streets, but they were alive, but not, (laughs) I would not call them powerful. They were alive, but not necessarily very active. They were very slow. And when you look at the word of God, it's both alive and active because it has a dynamic force within it. It's the work of the spirit of God. So anyway, God's word does things. Man's words lack the life changing dynamic. Now, look, I love entertainment. I love reading. You know, I read, you'd be surprised by this. Maybe you're not, Uh, but I like reading technical manuals about fixing things. I've been an aircraft mechanic before I went into the ministry. Uh, I built uh, muscle cars, Chevelles. Um, I like technology, as you can see. You know, I read everything about these microphones, about this um, uh, equipment here, about the camera that I've got uh, uh, broadcasting this, the software. I like reading, you know, none of that stuff brings life. It doesn't mean it's forbidden. You know, we can read things. Some of it though ought to be forbidden. You know, I, I filter everything through the word of God, but some stuff is just plain technology or science or even entertainment or there's no, it's, this stuff is not forbidden to Christians but it doesn't bring life. I can't pretend that these hobbies of mine, and this is kind of a hobby of mine, it kind of, you know, I like to do the word of God and I like to do these hobbies. So the word of God is living and active and powerful and man's words lack a life-changing dynamic. I love learning, but I'm disillusioned with the writings of man. And I, I look at it, this verse There's no power in man's words, and they're not active or life-changing or life-giving. The Word of God, on the other hand, is living and powerfully, actively at work in the heart and the soul of man. There's a dynamic of activity in it. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, For this reason we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Listen to this. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, you have to highlight that, underline that, put a star next to that, circle it, get that memorized, that the word of God effectively works in those who believe. That's what Paul talked to the church at Thessalonica about. 
that the word of God effectively works in those who put their trust in it. When you put your trust in the word of God as you read it and say, this is from you, God, and not from man, it has a dynamic, effective work in the heart of man. And that's what happened when the Apostle Paul comes rolling in with his missionary team to Thessalonica. Uh, They begin to minister the word of God, the truth of the word of God. And the Thessalonians wonderfully responded. Don't you love that? When people respond to the word of God, they receive it. Well, not just as an interesting message, but that it was in deed and in truth, the very word of God, and it effectively worked in those who believe. And I think that's a very encouraging thing to me because I need transformation daily. I believe you do. Uh, You're probably like me. There are areas of my emotional topography that can go from mountain peaks to valleys Sometimes with a lot of stability and mundane everyday, uh, you know, daily grind. But I need an encouragement that God is not done with me, that he's still working in me and upon me. And there's a transformation available for me. And it's in the word of God as I put my trust in it. Uh, my confidence in what God is telling us, the word of God goes to work effectively. Well, we're out of time for this podcast. So I'm going to um, sign off now. God bless you. Make sure you listen to the next episode. So this is part one of a two-part series in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 on the ability and character of God's word. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. You can learn more at jeffchristensen.org. That's jeffchristensen.org. And be sure to share this podcast with a friend. Well, may the Lord richly bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.